and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from July 1989. I get mobile. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with a compendium. But first, it's the news. If you ever bought a cheap joystick back in the day, you would have undoubtedly got a poor Leaf Switch one, destined to be destroyed by the 10th game of Daily Thompson's Decathlon. Connix, famous for its navigator joystick, is to offer a better quality microswitch joystick for around the same price as those cheap things you bought because you didn't have enough cash for a decent one. This new joystick is called a Mega Blaster, and Connix claim it is the cheapest microswitch joystick available, and it will sell for $8.99. After the success of the classic film and subsequent game, Activision have grabbed the rights for the sequel to Ghostbusters, craftily titled Ghostbusters 2. As with all movie titans and press releases, the game is said to follow the plot closely, and will be in the shops when the film is released in December. If you ever wanted to upgrade your Spectrum, Video Vault, best known for Spectrum repairs, is to offer what it calls the upgraded system. The whole thing consists of a Clive Drive interface, which is a rather obscure disk drive system that includes a user port, whatever that is, the Clive Drive itself, which uses the non-standard 3-inch disks that are not compatible with the Plus 3, but does offer Microdrive Command compatibility, and a Hush printer, which is an 8.5-inch thermal etching device, and this whole package will cost $149.95. Microprose has doubled its size in one move by purchasing Telecomsoft, making it one of the largest software publishers in Europe. There are no details of the money involved, but this puts Microprose in a strong position for the year, what they do with the name or staff is another matter, and we shall have to wait for that answer. With most budget labels pushing out games at $2.99, Elite have announced in a bold move that their new budget label called Encore will release games at a cheaper price of $1.99. Unlike its first attempt at a budget label, this one lasted longer than a few months and has yet not come under legal attack from rights holders. This move may point users to the cheaper option, but when asked, at least according to Yoss and Claire, Elite said that only some of the titles will be $1.99, so yet another market employ to fool the game-playing public. And that was the news, and now onto the top-selling games, which seems to be getting repetitive. At number 5 is Operation Wolf from Ocean Software. At number 4, Dragon Ninja, also from Ocean. At number 3, Renegade 3 from Imagine. At number 2, Emlyn Hughes International Soccer from Audiogenic. And at number 1, Robocop from Ocean. And that was the news and top selling games from July 1989. several ways to play Spectrum games on the move. On your smartphone, on a small handheld device like a GP32, or any number of handheld Android devices, or even an Omni 128 that I looked at in episode 71. Most just require an emulator and some game ROMs, but some require a bit more effort. Recently I discovered this in a drawer at my partner's house. She had not used it for over six years, and she had forgotten she even had it. Here was an opportunity, I thought, to get some mobile specky gaming in. This is a Nintendo DS Lite, and up until I found it, I knew very little about emulation and homebrew on it. Getting Spectrum games on here is not as simple as loading an emulator, but after a few hours of research, I had my first games running, after an important piece of the puzzle had been ordered and duly delivered. To make the DS Lite accessible so emulators can be loaded, you need an additional card. There are several available, and I ordered mine from China, for around £7. It arrived in less than a week, and then the work began. There are other ways to do this, with other types of cards, so this is by no means a definitive way. Once I had the card, in this case an R4 SDHC, 
I then needed a micro SD card, which I already had. With an adapter, you plug the micro SD card into a PC, download the firmware from the card site, and just copy the folders across to the FAT32 formatted card. You take the SD card out of the adapter and plug it into the R4 card. You put the card into the DS Lite, and this will allow software to be executed from the SD storage. The next step was to grab a Spectrum emulator, and I opted for ZXDS from the address on screen. Placing this and a few game files in a folder, it was time to try it out. To be honest, I wasn't expecting it to work. I had an old handheld console I wasn't sure it even worked properly, a strange card from China, and some files I had just downloaded. I had little idea of how it would work, so when I turned on the DS Lite, not much seemed to happen. After a few minutes though, I discovered if I selected a thing named Bomberman Land, the DS Lite dropped into a new interface. And from here, I selected the games option, and then something called Moon SHL2. And there was the ZXDF file ready to start working. And yes, it did. It took another few minutes to work out the settings, which are very comprehensive and allow all kinds of things to be changed. You can emulate different types of joystick, including Kempston. You can change the video options, the sound options, and even the model it's going to be emulated. So quickly to test it, I fired up Antiquity Jones and had a quick play. If you have a game that doesn't work on a Kempston joystick option, you can choose a different one like a Cursor or Sinclair, or even set predefined keys yourself. And these can be mapped to the D-pad and any one of the buttons. And this is useful for older games that don't support joysticks, or games that require more than just a fire button. The emulator will emulate various models as I've said before, and even includes things like ULA Plus mode. The lower screen shows you a keyboard, one of two, either the 48K or the Plus, and these actually work, so if you really wanted to, you could play adventure games. My stylus seemed a bit out on some keys, as you can probably tell, and I'm still looking into that. It may be because the DS Lite has not been used for six years and needs setting up again. The games don't load instantly, but they are quicker than normal, and you're soon playing your favourites. This is brilliant, and the screen is excellent. It produced a really good picture, and I'm surprised at just how good it was. The sound too was spot on, both the 48k beeper and the 128k AY chip worked great, and once you got the control set up, it was easy to play Spectrum games like this. I know there are other, less legal things you can do with an R4 card, for example you could download illegal Nintendo ROMs, but I would never do that sort of thing. I actually do have some originals though and may even look at buying some more, now I've got the thing working. But for now, I'll just stick with Spectrum games. For those wanting to play games on a handheld, and who were, shall we say, disappointed with a certain item that never materialised, then this is a brilliant way to get better results. You can get a DS Lite on eBay for less than £20, so it's a lot cheaper too, and you have a full choice of all the games you want to throw at it. Overall, a brilliant way to get your Spectrum fix on the move. In the 80s, the arcades was full of alien shooters and platform games, but every now and then, a new game concept came along. Burger Time, although not a million miles away from a platform game, had sufficient differences to make it worth a second look. There were very few versions of this game on the Spectrum, the only other notable one was Mr. Wimpy by Ocean Software. This is Barmy Burgers from Blobby Computer Games, released in 1983. It follows the arcade version closely, and looks very similar. The idea is to move across the various parts of the burger, and as you do they drop down, and once the burgers are all complete, at the bottom of the screen, the level is over, and you move on to the next one.
In your way are various food nasties, including a sausage and an egg. You can use pepper to stop them, and you have a limited amount of this, but this doesn't last long, and it isn't permanent. The dropping burger parts can also be used to kill the nasties, if you time things right, but they soon reappear again. The graphics are close enough to the arcade, obviously taking into account the limits of the spectrum. Sound is used well, with some standard zap effects for different parts of the game, including the use of pepper, death routines and the falling parts of the burger. Controls can be a bit sticky at times, which is a shame, and you can find yourself not getting up a ladder in time, and the game also pauses when the burger parts drop down, which sort of disrupts gameplay a little bit. With only Mr Wimpy as a contender, this is a brave attempt by Plabby, and the end result is a playable game, but as an early release it does suffer in a few areas and could have been so much better had it been written later on, when the spectrum had been ripped apart and new tricks learnt. Not bad then, if you like the arcade version, but it does suffer from the early game syndrome. This is Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge, released in 1990 by Gremlin Graphics. This game will be known to many players, as it was also available on other formats, including the Amiga and Atari ST. The Spectrum version is much the same game, with the player having to qualify through various phases to earn their Lotus license. The game starts with some nice music and detail screens, which are interesting the first time you see them. to the game then. There are plenty of settings for the player, included control method, difficulty and gear change options, and once you get everything set up as you want, the first race begins. Taking up the top third of the screen, the play area looks and feels tiny. The bottom third contains a picture of the car, and the middle third holds position, gear and speed information, amongst other things. In play, the sound is quite nice, with a really good engine sound. However, this cuts out when the tyre screeching sound is used, which is a bit of a pity really. Control is nice and crisp, and despite having a small play area, the feeling of speed is portrayed really well. The problem you will encounter is jumps, as the road moves up and down to replicate hills and valleys. When you go over a jump, the track vanishes beneath you and you have no idea where you're going to land. This could be off-road, or on top of a rock, or even on top of another car. If you do go off-road though, your speed drops, making qualifying harder, and hitting other cars also slows you down, but at least you don't burst into flames like some other games. The graphics as you can see are well drawn and are monochrome with shading, and the car's animation as it turns works really well. Roadside objects too look fine, and the split colour scheme works most of the time. The colours do change for each level and each track, but to be honest, each track feels pretty much the same as the last one. Difficulty is okay, giving a long enough game, but getting past the other cars can be tricky if there's a lot of them or the road becomes narrow. On my first couple of attempts, I failed to qualify, but as I got used to the controls and the cornering, I managed to qualify at last. The game has a two-player mode too, which is simultaneous, and uses the bottom third of the screen as the second player view, which is a neat idea. 
but I would still like to have had the single player window much larger for single player games. Overall, a good racer then, and one to try out if you enjoy driving games. This is Old Tower, released by Retro Souls in 2018, and here we have an excellent puzzle game with unique movement patterns. The idea is simple, collect all of the items and get to the end point to finish the level. However, it's not that simple, because of the way the character moves. Once he sets off in a direction, he will keep going until he hits something solid, and this means you have to work out your route carefully. The graphics are brilliant and very colourful as you can see, and the scrolling play area is a great addition and adds that extra something. There is music playing throughout, which really helps this game along too. As the levels progress, Things get added, such as moving enemies, and bricks that only appear after you touch a certain area of the screen. You also get lasers and one-way walls, and further on a double character to control. So there's a lot in this game. Very much a brain challenge, and something definitely worth checking out. So, what um, other questions do we have? Next question is, most lusted after Spectrum accessory back in the day? That's easy. That's easy for me as well. Go on, then you, My, you can kick that one off. Mine was a ComCon um, programmable in, uh, joystick interface. You know that one with oh. the little plugs yeah. that you put in the key sockets? Yeah, I've, and... I've got one of those, yeah. Yeah, I've got one now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's heavy, it's made out of metal. It's, it's a, a beefy piece of kit, isn't it? It is a beefy piece of kit. You could just then you could put your joystick to anything and I know very uh, clever, very yeah, good. very very, and it didn't take up any me extra memory like some of the programmable interfaces did. So what was yours? For me, it was the Challenge Sprint, which was a turbo loading cassette player. Oh really? Because I was I was fed up of waiting five minutes for games to load, and that was the sort of this was before the micro drives arrived, which was which sort of took over the most lusted after. I wanted the challenge sprint. I wanted something to load the tapes faster, and that looked really cool. Um, I've never actually seen one on eBay. I don't know anyone who's got one. And then the microdrive and interface one arrived, and that became the most lusted after item. Yeah. After that, next one was the VTX 5000 modem. I really, really wanted one of those, and I ended up getting that as well. So, so I had three really in, in succession. The challenge sprint I'd never even heard of till you mentioned it. It'd be good if you could get one and do a review on it, Paul. Oh, I'd love to do one of them. Yeah, um, I, there are adverts for it, and the, I think there's some photographs on various websites. But I don't. I've, I've yet to see them on eBay, and if any of them do turn up, they're going to go for stupid prices. So uh, follow it. Following on from that, then the did, next. Did it? Did it even materialise? Did it ever go to market? Yeah. Or was it just there, a... are fo there, there are photographs of them. I think Ross has got some photographs of them. On. So did it work with a normal tape, or did you need? To... It looked like a normal tape, but it plugged into the user interface. Yeah, but could you could you put your commercial copy yeah, of Manny Miner yeah. in there and yeah yeah it, it, yeah? And what I would it do? It did, load, it. load a bit of code first, and then I really don't play, know. Play it's, it really it's, quickly. It's, <laughs> I think it did. But looking at the photograph, it looks like a normal tape player, but it's got a, a wide ribbon connector coming out of it to go into the um, to, into the part at the back. So ah, uh, that makes sense. 
I think. So we'll see. But yeah, it's uh, very interesting to see how that works. On, again, the flip side of that is the most lusted after Spectrum accessory now. My most lusted, lusted after Spectrum accessory now was a, a certain handheld device that never arrived. What was that? <laughs> yeah, so, um, and then shortly after that, obviously, the Spectrum Next. Yeah, I think it's going to be the Next now. But is that an accessory? That's not an accessory, is it? That is a machine itself, so does that count as an accessory? Possibly not. The funny thing is, all, all the accessories I want now, I've pro- I think I've got. I've got I think so I've many got card interfaces. And... I haven't got, I mean, there are a lot of storage interfaces that I haven't got, but I've got three different ones, and do I really need any more? The other thing is the ZX HD, which outputs the output, um, the Spectrum to HDMI. Yes. Um, again, would... it'd be interesting to look at and play with, but I, w- it's, I wouldn't say I lusted after it. Yeah, I wouldn't say I lusted after it. Maybe we need to find something and not buy it so we can lust after it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure something will come along at some point. Yeah. So are there, are uh, there any more questions? Uh, the next and last question is, what TV programs or what computer-related TV programs did you watch back in the day? Which is a good question, mm. because... One of the main aims of the Spectrum show was to do a TV-like show that I wanted to watch back in the day, which wasn't available to me yeah. in 83, 84. Um, but moving forward, I don't recall watching any of the programs. There's things like Micro Live I never watched, Games Master I might have watched one or two, um, Bad Influence I... I never watched any, and the Computer Program I never watched any. What kind of game, Games Master and... Bad influence and those ones were poor spectrum, really, weren't they? Yeah. So they, yeah. they weren't very spectrum related. I watched Micro Live. I really enjoyed Micro Live. Right. I used to like Micro Live. It changed as well. Oh, I think it changed. It went from an educational program to an informational program, more of a news program, and a business news program as well. Originally, it seemed very educational. They talked about computers and how they worked and new innovation and things like that, which I guess is news. Um, but but when it was new inf- innovation, it was how the innovation worked. It was a bit almost a bit tomorrow's worldy to start with. Then it went much okay. more kind of business information. Maybe maybe I've got that wrong. It, it it was certainly a very mature program. It was hard watching for a for a kid, however old I was when it was. <laughs> it was on. Um, yes. And I also remember the BBC had some. It was Sunday morning, quite early on on BBC Two. I think they were. It was, it was almost certainly BBC Two. They had some programming kind of programs where they they. They basically taught you how to do a basic program. They started with, you know, the the bomber one where you get something going along the top and you drop bombs yeah. onto the city yeah. and it goes lower every time. And if you hit one of the buildings, you're dead. Basically, yeah. they did. I remember them doing one of them and me following through that before I had a computer and just kind of getting the very rudimentaries of basic coding through that, uh, okay. which is which is good. Oh, but that's I can't remember what it was called. If anyone knows, <laughs> put it in the comments. <laughs> They're the questions um, from Patreon. Thank you, people, for asking those questions. Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. If you've got any more, send them in. This is Apple Jam, released by DK Tronics in 1983. It's a very early game with a typically silly premise. The idea is you control a character that has to eat all the apples as they drop down and also eat the jam as it drops down. And each time you eat something, you put on weight. And if you put on too much weight, you'll have a heart attack and die. You can keep in good shape though by visiting the sauna on the right hand side of the screen. But while you do this, the apples and jam will continue to fall. If they get onto the lower part of the screen, there's a rat that scurries across and eats it. And every time that eats something, that gets larger too. And when it gets to a certain size, it will jump up onto the top level that you're on and try and kill you. To avoid the rat, you have to jump into the lift on the left hand side and using timing, drop it on top of the rat to kill it. With some gruesome results. As the game progresses, a hornet may appear too, and the only way to avoid this is to jump in the sauna again. 
So it's a lot of running about and timing things so that you can eat the apples, lose some weight in the sauna and squash the rat. The game has basic graphics, as you can see, and everything moves in character jumps. The sound too is basic, but then again this is a 16K game from 1983. The control is quite responsive, so at least there's no problems there, and I think there is a game in there somewhere if you dig hard enough. Yes, it's not the best game, but certainly original and maybe one to try if you're bored one afternoon. Arcade Games Designer, the tool used to create a lot of Spectrum games, has been around for a long time. Yes, in fact over 10 years. And to celebrate this, Stone Chat Productions have put together an electronic magazine called AGD Compendium. It lists all of the games created using this tool, along with a score based on the author's review. You can view the games in various orders, from old to new, or by score, or even randomly. You can also pick a game using the main character tile picker. There are a lot of games in there, and some you may be familiar with, and my games are also included, but you never know as you browse along you may find some hidden gems. This is a nice little package that you can use to browse games created using this excellent tool. Certainly worth a quick browse, if you've got some time to spare. <laughs> 